Stand by for Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors with your host, Drew Kirby. Hey, this is Luke Holmes. I am Morgan Wallen. I'm Riley Green. I'm Travis Denning. Hey, I'm Aaron Lewis. <laughs> hey, it's Luke Bryan. I'm Tim McGraw. What's up? This is Ian Munsick. Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors. Thank you so much for tuning in to Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors. As always, you can reach out to us and interact with us in our station's app. Just click the Message Us button up in the right corner, and you can send us any kind of message. Today, a very fun and exciting show. We have lots of guests. We'll talk to Jim Crowley from Jim Crowley Outdoors in just a little while. He has some ideas and inside tips of how to get your kids started fishing and what you need to get them. Plus, if you want your kids, or maybe you're a single mother and you want to get your kid involved or you yourself want to get involved in the outdoors, the First Hunt Foundation is a great organization. We'll talk to Fred Williams just down the line here a little bit. But first, Janet Millick and Matt Hahn from Wyoming Game and Fish Department with us today because at midnight on Monday the 20th, Something big starts happening, and it's the Flushing Flow, the annual event that basically sweeps out the North Platte River. Janet, this is a fascinating part of Central Wyoming that happens every March. That's right. You know, it does depend on the weather conditions and and lots of other things, construction projects, and so on and so forth. But it is time for the North Platte River Flushing Flows. Now, Matt, the river still has ice in some places. How is this Flushing Flow going to affect that? We work with the Bureau of Reclamation pretty closely in terms of the timing of this and uh, due to the obvious concerns with dislodging huge amounts of ice, uh, we always wait until the ice is basically gone from the river, at least the big shelves of ice. The ice has been melting pretty quick here the last week or so. Looking at some fairly recent satellite photos, it doesn't look like there's really much for ice left on the river other than some of the stuff that's left over on the banks from ice jams this winter. The first day of the flush, so on Monday, the flows are only going to go up to 2,000 CFS instead of the normal four. And uh, we've done this in the past. It's basically to sort of gently nudge some of that ice out of the way so the big 4,000 CFS pulse doesn't just gather it all up and send it all down at once. And for those people who maybe don't follow the CFS, so the cubic feet per second flow of the river, it has been rolling about 450. And so if you look out the window um, and you kind of see it's a little bit lower, that's about 450 to 500 CFS. And so when Matt talks about 2,000 and then going up to 4,000 for the remainder of the flush, you know it's going to go from kind of these shallow waters to something that's pretty deep. And, you know, if anyone is like me, when you're kind of out in the zone, whether you're fishing or walking your dog or just kind of enjoying nature, you're not maybe paying super close attention to, um, you know, things that may be going on around you, like the water rapidly increasing in depth. And so it's maybe not rapid, but it's it's fast enough that you can catch yourself and get stuck on an island if you're kind of wading out in the middle. And that has happened in the past. And so one of the things we want to do is remind sportsmen um, and women that are out enjoying outdoors, any recreationists, anglers that just be cautious as you know, this ice starts to move through as we bump some of that down the river, as well as the increase in flows. This procedure has been going on since 1995 or so. And what's the idea behind a flushing flow? The flushing flow is really designed to clean the spawning habitat for trout in the river. So uh, trout need pretty clean gravel to successfully spawn. If there's too much fine sediment, so like silt and, and sand in, in the riverbed, it'll actually suffocate the eggs. Uh, they need kind of some water flowing across them. And so the flushing flow essentially mimics kind of a natural uh, spring flow where, you know, in an undammed river in the spring, you get that those pulses of high water as the snow is melting and that Increased depth and velocity is really effective at flushing out a lot of the fine silt and sand that's accumulated in the river channel over the course of the winter. Um, And so being downstream of these reservoirs, we don't get that natural pulse of water anymore because the reservoirs are designed to store that for use later in the year. So these artificial pulses of water that 
that uh, we work with the Bureau of Reclamation to provide essentially just cleans, you know, it's like sweeping the floor. You're just cleaning out all the winter accumulation of fine sediment from the spawning gravel. And we try to do it right now, which is essentially immediately prior to the peak of rainbow trout spawning. And so here we'll do the flushing flow and then almost immediately you'll see fish really starting to respond and there'll be fish spawning all over, especially in the upper 10 or so miles of river. When this started back in 95, the goal was to improve the fish in the North Platte. Has this worked and what is the the science behind that? So back in the day, you know, going back into the 60s, 70s, into the early 80s, the river, basically, there was no natural reproduction of trout in the river. It was stocked every year with, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, fingerling trout. There was just survey after survey showed that there was just zero reproduction. And uh, so the, the fish population in the river was really limited by what the hatcheries could produce and stock in in a given year. So there were some logistical constraints in terms of just how many fish can you put, can you justify putting in a single body of water? And gosh, I think it was probably in the mid 1980s, there were some really wet years and uh, Pathfinder Reservoir spilled. Um, There was a lot of water in the system and the river through town here was flowing you know, in excess of five or 6,000 CFS for a good chunk of the summer. And what that did is that cleaned out all that, that fine sediment that it accumulated over you know, decades, basically in the bottom of the river. And, and lo and behold, they just had trout reproducing and had wild trout all over in the river. Um, based on that, one of my predecessors going back, uh, Bill Witcher's, um, kind of came up with the idea that, hey, I wonder if we could uh, kind of mimic this, um, work with the Bureau of Reclamation to do it. And uh, that kind of kicked off a master's project or a series of master's projects out of the University of Wyoming to determine kind of what the minimum magnitude of flow would be needed to kind of replicate that that cleaning procedure that, that Mother Nature gave us in the 80s. And so that kicked off a couple years of of research and and kind of working with the Bureau of Reclamation to figure out what was feasible. And it turned out that uh, the 4,000 CFS flows were successfully able to clean the gravel out. But even more importantly than that, from the Bureau of Reclamation standpoint, is that they could provide those flows without losing any capacity to generate electricity and that is using water that is destined for glendo anyway so they're taking water that would normally be moved to glendo this time of year and instead of moving it over the course of a month they're moving it over the course of a few days and still able to generate electricity and all that on it so that's really why we're able to do that given given water law in the West and everything like that. So we've seen great growth then in the trout numbers since these flushing flows began. Oh yeah. You know, back when it was totally reliant on stocking the numbers, the number of fish per mile was usually less than a thousand. Oftentimes it was down in the four or 500 fish per mile range. And, and again, like I said, that was due to logistics of how many fish can you reasonably raise to put in the river. And so now, since we've started doing the flushing flows, we we have a management objective up at Gray Reef for 3,600 trout per mile, and that's kind of what we consider an average. It's been as high as about 9,000 fish per mile in recent memory and down as low as about 2,000, but we typically have somewhere in the three to 4,000 fish per mile, and that's uh, being driven completely by uh, natural reproduction. The flushing flows will begin Monday morning at midnight. The peak times are between 3 and 7 a.m. And then that, that that's when they go up to 2,000 at that point, Matt? Or are they going to be a little higher then? So on Monday, the Bureau is going to take the flows up to 2,000 to kind of ease some of that ice out of the system. And then starting Tuesday, the peak will be 4,000. And so it up at Gray Reef Dam, they start increasing the flow at midnight. It kind of steps up until it gets to the peak, which for most of the flush will be 4,000. It's held there from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. 
and then it's stepped back down to 450 and that gets back down to the base flow at about 10 a.m up there the flows are high in the middle of the night up at gray reef and back down to normal kind of mid-morning but that pulse of water takes time to travel down the river so you'll see in, in town here you'll see the water start to come up in like mid-afternoon and it'll peak it usually peaks sometime around five or six o'clock at night here so you won't see the pulse in the morning you'll see it in the afternoon down here and obviously the farther down river you go the, the later if you were wanting to watch this and and see it come down i mean can you obviously tell the difference when this pulse of water is moving through yeah you know you can come down like come down to the game and fish office or Murad park or any of the access points along the river and if you show up you know noon one o'clock or so you'll see the river is just the normal what it looks like every every day and if you hang around, you'll see it's not really noticeable. Like you don't see a wall of water or anything coming down the river like a flash flood. But dink around with your dog or something, and then you look back at the river 10 minutes later, and it's noticeably higher. And then it'll be noticeably higher. And you'll see, especially in the first handful of days of the flush, you'll see a real noticeable difference in the color. Like it'll be noticeably dirtier and you'll see a lot of floating debris, you know, that all the cattails and tree limbs and everything else that have accumulated in the river over, over the winter, you'll see, especially in the first day or two, tumbleweeds and all kinds of stuff coming down the river. And then with each successive day, you'll notice when the peak kind of rolls through town, the water will be a little bit clearer and cleaner each day. And it's really noticeable the higher, the farther up river you go. So by the sixth or seventh day, say where the Gray Reef boat ramp is, even though the water's running 4,000 CFS, it's it's actually pretty clean and clear. So Matt, with this water flushing down the river system, it ends up in Glendo, which you said earlier that it's meant for. Is that going to change what the ice conditions are, if there are any left? Yeah, Glendo, you know, that water all gets captured in Glendo, so the, the elevation of Glendo will come up. Uh, a foot or two uh, as it captures all that water and any of the shore ice that's left although it is getting pretty rotten right now um, you know the shorelines will definitely be impacted by this down at Glendo the the main body of the ice on the lake is pretty thick right now and it probably won't impact that but it'll definitely impact your ability to access that main ice pack I mean, those shorelines are really going south in a hurry right now. So um, by Monday, it may not even be a real good idea to go out on Glendo. Yeah. So just make sure if you're planning on ice fishing on Glendo over the next 10 days as this flushing flow is going on, this is one of those things to pay attention to if you're out on the the main body of, of water ice fishing that the shore ice may change before you can get off. Excellent. Janet, Matt, thank you so much. Remember the flushing flow on the North Platte starting at midnight for the next 10 days. It's going to be a little different. So if you're out and about, be sure to to be careful and aware of what you're doing and what's going on. In just minutes, we're back with Brian from Rocky Mountain Discount Sports. It's Wyoming hooking and hunting outdoors. Welcome back to Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors. It's Drew along with Brian Woodward from Rocky Mountain Discount Sports. And uh, I don't want to jinx us, but is spring coming? Because I think we're all jonesing. Yeah, we have, uh, we've had a couple 50-50 days last week, right, with uh, 50, 50 degrees and 50-mile-an-hour winds and uh, a couple 60-degree days. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be, uh, again, pick your days and let's go do something. You know, we've had these 50-degree days over the last few days anyway, a little bit of snow here and there. But when we get into this, I really start thinking about camping. And and I know that you guys have everything you need for a camping trip, even if it's cold weather. you got that cold weather gear. Yeah, you can definitely make it happen and make it comfortable, um, you know, with a nice uh, sleeping bag, a good tent, you know, maybe a Mr. Heater, some hand warmers. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely doable. Uh, there's definitely some challenges with the snow on the ground, especially in the high country here. It's, right. it's, uh, it's, it's the real deal. You know, and you guys, you were talking about having the heating systems, but outside of that, you have grilling systems. Even if you're going to go out and do some ice fishing, 
Why not make a day of it and take a Coleman grill with you? Yeah, um, you know, we talked about ice conditions in the last few weeks where they're they're definitely starting to uh, teeter a little bit. Um, somebody told me just the other day that there was a little bit of an open pocket of water on uh, Alcova. But, you know, the edges have been still pretty good. They're going to start flushing the river starting tomorrow. And when they start doing that, you know, water's going to be flowing through those reservoirs and down river. And so it's going to uh, start breaking some stuff up and could possibly create some uneasy uh, conditions on those reservoirs. Yeah, and we've been talking, you know, really for the past four, five, six months about the ice and how important it is for safety uh, earlier in the season a couple of fellows over in the keyhole area um, fell through the ice. So really just being safe is one of the biggest concerns right now. Yeah. So, I mean, just, you know, buddy system, you know, make sure you've got throwables and life jackets and, you know, things that you don't necessarily think about when you're typically ice fishing. But, you know, good uh, a good plan for some safety equipment to be close and nearby. It was a couple years ago we had guys that the uh, ice broke off the shoreline and they were, you know, 30 feet from shore where they had to pretty much swim back to shore to get their equipment off. Yeah, when you're thinking about safety equipment, uh, think about what you have on your boat. If you have it on your boat, it's good to be carrying around with you. What I'd like on my boat is me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it, and, you know, you've really been talking about the Wyoming walleye stampede that's coming up, and you're kind of getting antsy, too. You're getting product in, and you're getting things together for that first uh, tournament day. You know, it doesn't take long when we start getting high winds and 50, 60-degree days. You know, they get one small pocket opened up, and then, you know, the next day there's, you know, 100 feet, and then there's 200 feet, and then pretty soon, you know, half the lake's open. So it can certainly happen really quick. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're – we're all just kind of holding our breath and knocking on wood and, and praying that that uh, water opens up as quick as possible. But we might be a couple weeks behind normal schedule, but I, I was looking through uh, some of my old photos and uh, I'm like, what was I doing this time last year? You know, and we were shooting snow geese uh, over in Torrington. We were we were on Glendo within about, we're about a week and a half, two weeks away last year. So we might be three weeks, maybe we're four weeks away. But yeah, before that first tournament, I think, you know, we'll be fine. In the meantime, the weather is up, it's down, we've got snow, we've got no snow, but there's great snow up on the mountain still, and it's good time to get out and enjoy it, maybe with a new pair of snowshoes. Well, and I told you last week, uh, you know, I took I took the side-by-side -side up to the cabin last <laughs> week, and I got my first experience in doing some hardcore snowshoeing uh, oh. when I had that uh, my side-by-side -side stuck. And you know, it's we talk about safety all the time, but that's a great point. Just having those with you it probably made your day because it would have really sucked not having them. I got the ca the side by side back to the cabin and then I sunk it. Um, but if I didn't have snowshoes, I don't know that I would. I might still be up there yeah, because which you know, I, isn't all bad. But. I st I stepped out of that side by side and I went right up to my hip in snow yeah and i don't know how you would get out you know trying to walk through three foot of snow where it's powdery and you're not you don't have a, a good base on it so i was glad that i had them and it was pretty entertaining i didn't quite have i, I brought some really heavy duty uh, muck boots with me that weren't really designed for the snowshoes that i had yeah. but i was able to get them strapped on and and it worked it worked just fine well being prepared is one of the things we talk about a lot because it's very important it could be life or death and if you need to be prepared prepared and and start getting some uh, safety equipment come on in and see him here rocky mountain discounts Sports. it's wyoming hooking and hunting outdoors all right we're back it's drew and brian woodward rocky mountain discount sports and uh brian we're to the point now we're all starting to jones for a little springtime action and fishing action and brian what's your thoughts uh when we may be out on the water with good water i would guess probably going to be the second or third weekend of april when a lot of the bigger reservoirs like let's say gray rocks and glendo are probably going to be opening first uh pathfinder might be a little bit later i mean it's a little bit higher elevation a little bit colder uh snowpack and ice is you know gosh hardly anybody's been even able to get into pathfinder so uh, really kind of hard to tell exactly what the uh, ice conditions are but it looks, and from what I've heard, it looks like the ice conditions are still pretty heavy up there. And uh, that's going to be 
I don't know. Maybe maybe mid-May. I don't know. You know, it may be a little longer, but still, now's a good time to start looking at that boat. You know, I was really thinking about the the guys that haven't touched their boat since maybe September or early October last year. That puppy's been sitting around for a while, and, you know, it's probably time to start looking at it. Yeah, you know, there's, especially with boats, you know, the first first couple trips out, you know, you, you tend to find a lot of guys sitting at the dock trying to get their boat started, right? And Or they find out that their battery's dead. So, you know, do some of that preparedness, you know, back at home, back in the driveway, get some muffs and get the, get the engines running ahead of time. Make sure that, you know, you've got good gas, that you've got, um, your, that your motor's going to start, your bilge pumps are going to work. Uh, all that, all that kind of stuff, because nothing more frustrating. I mean, for yourself or other other anglers, when you you got that guy on the dock and the wind's blowing their boat sideways, they can't get another boat in. This guy's sitting there trying to get his boat started, um, and then it's just not safe if you don't if you if you can't rely on your on your boat, and especially this time of year. A lot of times, you know, the ice isn't completely off the reservoir, right? You know, there, there might be a few big sections or chunks or areas at Glendo you might be able to get a boat in. Um, but you got to be careful. I mean, if the wind sh- uh, sh- shifts on you, entire, you know, football fields worth of ice can all of a sudden be moving and shifting and, you know, get, get between you and a shoreline. And, and basically, there's nothing you can do. That, that ice is so much heavier and stronger than your boat that all of a sudden that ice pushes you up onto shore or prevents you from getting back to a, a boat ramp. So. That's really one of the things that it's so unpredictable. I mean, not only getting out there, maybe getting blocked in by ice, but what if you get out there and you haven't worked on your boat at all, haven't gotten it up to date, and it starts fine, but then you get out on the water and, you know, then you get stuck because it breaks down. Yeah, and, you know, and uh, this time of year, I mean, I've, I've uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people nicknamed me Mudward because, uh, you know, one of the first trips that I met a handful of my angler friends was over on the Miracle Mile, and I, I got off into a, a flat area and sunk my truck. And so, you know, a good tow rope, uh, and you don't have much cell coverage over there. So, you know, make sure somebody knows where you're at and where you're going. It's an exciting time of, of the year, and, and I know that we talked a lot through the fall and even late summer last year about how the electronics really can benefit you. And, and with water levels kind of iffy at this point until we get a lot of the snow melt, mm-hmm. you know, making sure that, that you maybe if you're going to get new electronics to get familiar with it before you head out on the water. Yeah, this is a great time, especially if you're planning on having like a, one of the boat dealerships do some of that work for you. Uh, before all the playboats have to get unwrapped and, you know, dewinterized and all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, utilize some of those boat dealers in the area. And, and uh, you know, if you need a new graph or want to update a new graph or maybe you need a new trolling motor or a bow mount, uh, now's a great time because they're they're not quite as busy now as, as they will be here in another six weeks. When we get to, to this kind of a situation and you know, you just talked about maybe getting new graphs or, or a whole new electronic system, every year they come out with, with upgrades mm-hmm. and how interchangeable are some of those? If you have a hum- hummingbird now and you stay with hummingbird, is it pretty interchangeable or... It, it depends on how many years back you go, you know, um, if you, the technology has changed a lot. So some of the sonars and some of the transducers are definitely, uh, better quality, better clarity than what we used to have, you know, 15, 20 years ago in terms of like networking capabilities. Um, everyone is so different, like on the, on the hummingbird stuff, uh, they've got uh, their products basically have like a, a the letter N after their number, so it's like a Gen 3 N, which means that they're networkable, and those are using a standard like um, uh, Ethernet cable, so they might communicate, but they may not give you all the features that you're looking for. So uh, even with bow mounts, uh, some of the technology on bow mounts, you know, with Minn Kota has um, down imaging, they have mega down imaging, and then they have just a regular universal sonar. All three are different, and all three of them. Uh, are going to give you different readings based on the graphs that you have hooked up to them. And not all graphs will hook up to each one. So, I mean, having uh, somebody that's knowledgeable about that, especially if you're planning on upgrading all of them or even just a portion of them, uh, to have somebody that can actually tell you, yeah, this is compatible, this one's not, so you're not throwing extra money at something that you don't need to. 
So stopping in here and seeing them at Rocky Mountain Discount Sports, a great idea if you want to upgrade or get new equipment. Now, we're getting closer and closer. We keep talking about it, but the walleye stampede is coming up. You guys still have some openings? Yeah, applications are actually rolling in pretty good. Um, You know, this first tournament usually has, you know, over 100 boats, and we're over halfway there right now. So, um, and it's still pretty early. Uh, May 13th and 14th is that first first event. Usually a pretty good jig and a minnow bite. Uh, a lot of times that first ice off bite is a little bit slower presentation. Yeah, numbers look good. We just picked up a new sponsor, Striker. Uh, they, they, they do uh, uh, ice apparel, and they also do just uh, hoodies and sun shirts and all that kind of stuff. And we just got them on board, so we've got some really cool shirts to, to sell and promote this year. I'm looking forward to that relationship. It's going to be great. And it's kind of neat seeing the app, the applications come through because, you know, a lot of just guys that have been fishing for years, a lot of guys are like, you know, one guy brings his brother down from Wisconsin, you know, and it's like every year they're like, yep, that's our trip. You know, that's our that's me and, me and my brother hanging out for three or four or five days and we're just going to go fish and go have fun. And uh, it's nice being able to see that people are actually planning on that and using it as a a time to just get out and relax and father son mother daughter brother brother i mean the whole family was there last year it, it's really kind of kind of fun we've got sponsors that do different divisions so we have like a family division and we have a young guns division so you're not only ever is everybody into the major pot the big pot but they're sponsors that have uh, supported the smaller divisions, so you're competing against a smaller sub- subset. So it's a great time to just get out. You know, you get to learn a bunch and spend some time with people you want to spend time with. And if you're interested in getting involved in the walleye stampede, you can go to their website. It's wyomingwalleyestampede.com. And there's drone videos, there's all kinds of information, and if you get nervous about fishing a tournament for the first time, they do have the video that's a drone. It's really cool. It's a great opportunity for you to kind of get a heads up on what's going on. If you are getting ready to get out on the water at some point this year, make sure you stop in here at Rocky Mountain Discount Sports to get yourself all geared up. It's Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors. Welcome back to Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors. You have the opportunity to reach out to us by getting into the station app, clicking on the message button, and that message will come right to us. Today, we're joined by one of my longtime buddies, an outdoor guru, Mr. Jim Crowley from Jim Crowley Outdoors. And Jim, thanks for coming on. Hey, buddy, it's always good to see. I really appreciate you having me back back on. So uh, great to talk to you. You know, one of the things that you have always been great about is if I had questions or if uh, a child or a parent has questions, you're very informative and you're patient with those kids because you know what it takes for your information to sink into these kids. They've got to be interested in it. And you, you have the perfect way to uh, display that information. And you've known me long enough, Drew. I'm just a bigger kid. I mean, right. and you know, a six-year-old's attention span is probably not much longer than mine. <laughs> so, you know, you 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 have to tell it to them in a way that keeps them excited, keeps them interested. But in most cases, especially when I'm talking to younger kids, now, you know, talking to high school and college st- students is completely different. Right. But when, you, when you're talking to younger kids about the outdoors, in a lot of cases, I'm not really talking to the kids in so much as that I'm talking to the parents because the parents are the ones who need to instill this in their kids. And, and that, you know, five, six, seven year old range, you know, I'm not looking to be the hero here. That's what their parents are for. Right. You know, and and I'm going to be I'm going to be teaching in a way or I'm going to be telling them in a way that the parents are going to need to pursue this and do this. I mean, that's what my dad did with me. That's what anybody who's worked in the outdoor industry. It's either father or their grandfather or grandmother, whatever. And they instilled these things in them. And as a parent or somebody that you know that you trust is going to have to be able to teach that kid and guide them in the right direction. Because anytime that they're in the outdoors, chances are that that has a serious chance of being a lifelong thing that they can learn from. As a parent, I really don't think you want to pass that up. And the fact that if you don't make it interesting to these kids, like you mentioned, a six-year-old has a six-second time you know, yeah. span that they're going to be paying attention. And if they're not grasping it that quickly, they're not going to take it and they're not going to enjoy it. Especially when we're talking about fishing. One of the things that I, that I talk to the parents about is, hey, listen, don't take the kids out there with a little rod and reel that you bought 10 years ago or five years ago and stick it in the garage. And you have a float or a bobber on there the size of a beach ball. 
and a big old hook and a, and a you know a lot of snap swivels and all kinds of hardware out there. Those kids aren't going to catch any fish. Get the smallest float you can. Get a small hook, and we go over some of that and some of the things that I'm talking about. But there are vid plenty of videos out there on it. It's a small piece of worm. You tie the hook directly to the hook. You're giving the child more of a chance to catch a fish than what you think they should be doing. Learn the correct stuff, just like anything else. Most kids at that young age, that you know what they like to do the most is cast and reel in, cast right. and reel in. So if, so if you give them the setup where they have a better chance of catching a fish, that, that's what gets kids interested. That's what got me interested. That's what I still love to catch from time to time. But it's that a bunch of action that those kids are going to want. And if they're not catching fish, hey, have them cast out real in. Check out the squirrels. Anything to keep them in the outdoors and keep them interested. A little background about you, Jim, is you've been a lifelong fisherman. You uh, started with your dad young, and then right. you decided, gosh, maybe almost 15, 16 years ago that you were going to transition to where you're going to do tournaments, you're going to uh, have uh, your outdoor shows, which you can go to jimcrowleyoutdoors.com or any of the social media to get to. You made that transition because you love the outdoors that much that it's such a passion for you. And it's such a passion for you to pass your knowledge on to, to the younger generations. And you'll go around to different sporting goods stores and you'll go around to all these outdoor shows yeah. and you'll give seminars to young and old alike just so that maybe what your uh, knowledge is is enough to to pass it on to where they continue. Right. I, I mean, this year, this is the busiest I've ever been. This is my thirtieth year in the outdoor industry. Tomorrow, I have a seminar to give. That will be my sixtieth one since December. Individual. Wow. It's the most I've ever done, and I'm extremely blessed and grateful for it because there's a lot of people that still, you know, actually more that want to see me than ever before. You know, and I'm sure a lot of it has to do with both shows that I have and everything, but also that I've been around for a long time. And I, I and I've, and I've done, I've gained a lot of knowledge over the years, both in, in being that young kid. My dad had me in a boat at three years old, you know, f fishing tournaments for 13 or 14 years, then getting into television, then expanding into the outdoor business even more than that and working with different companies and everything. And it is, it's been a lifelong passion of mine. I've been very, very fortunate um, to fish and hunt most of my life. And, and so I, I get excited when I see a kid who has a passion or I, I had one on the show the other night, he's 20 years old and already fishing, you know, full time and finishing up college. And so it gives me hope um, for the future because one, he's extremely smart in business Two, he's very good at time management, which you have to be. And just thinking, I'm like, I haven't even met his parents and I'm thinking, you know, what kind of upbringing did he have? Because they were instilling these things in him at a, at a young age. And obviously he's taken full advantage of it with his passion. He's going to have a very successful life and a very successful career. And, and that's one thing that I, I think is one of the things that I talk to parents about is, you know, just don't think this can be a hobby. Yes. In most cases, it probably will be. I was an only child from the city of Chicago and I ended up working in the outdoor industry. You don't, you don't know uh, what's going to happen, but the love of the outdoors, if, if it's instilled in people at a young age, it can be with them their entire life. Give a, an example of, of maybe a small kit or something that a parent can put together for a reasonable price, you know, to, to give their kid that opportunity. You can go to a store like a store like Shields for example, talk to somebody there in the fishing department, bring your child to the store. And I'm sure there's plenty of stores like that. Maybe in some mom and pop stores, tell the person what you want to accomplish. All of us at one point or another, when it came to the outdoors or anything for that matter, ask for help, ask for advice and ask them how to set you up so you can at least start the process. Because remember something, when you do this with a young child, you know what memories those kids are going to remember as they grow older? They're going to remember that mom or dad did that. I can tell you when I was in Little League, I remember playing baseball. I can't tell you any of the games we won. I can tell you the first fish I caught. I can tell you who I was with. I can tell you at three years old where I was at. You need to understand why the outdoors is so important and what it can do with the bond for you and your children. It's an absolutely incredible thing. If you're not sure, find out, do the research because it will be worth it and it will add even more to the relationships you already have. Great advice, Jimmy. Jim Crowley Outdoors is about ready to start filming season two. And where can people find you? Well, we're, we're a lot. So we're on the Wired to Fish TV network. And Wired to Fish TV is on a bunch of different streaming channels. So if you have Plex, we just signed FUBU or FUBO. 
which is one of the biggest sports first channels out there. Now Wired to Fish is on uh, on Fubo too. And so my show, Jim Crowley Outdoors, is on Monday through Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 4 p.m. Uh, Central Time. So that's how if you just go to find Wired to Fish TV, look for Jim Crowley Outdoors. I'm on there depending on your time zone every day at two or four o'clock. And then my radio show, which is Slick Fish Radio. Slick Fish Radio can easily be found on Roku, Fire TV, Amazon Music, iTunes, Spotify. Jim Crowley Outdoors is where you go find out more about Jim. Get in contact with Jim if you have questions or uh, listen to his radio show and find out where to watch him on TV. And Jim, it's always great to talk to you. Way informational, and uh, and I know you're going to keep on keeping on. Thanks, brother. God bless you and all your listeners. Always a pleasure to talk to a good friend of mine. It's Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors. Welcome back to Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors. Of course, reach out to us through the radio stations app to ask any questions or give us any information you may want to share with us. And now we bring in uh, our longtime friend from a year ago, Fred Williams, uh, who is with the First Hunt Foundation in Wyoming. Now, this program is a big, big program that's that's really changing the outlook of the outdoors for a lot of people that are just trying to get started. And Fred, I was browsing through the website and noticed that the number of mentors throughout Wyoming to help people get started is really growing. And there's quite a few in all parts of the state. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Drew, I really appreciate once again, having the first hunt foundation on your program. And as you said, the, uh, the first hunt foundation, uh, it, it has really continued to grow rapidly here in the state of Wyoming. It's the largest boots on the ground, all volunteer based organization in the state getting women and youth into the outdoors. It's grown to have a footprint of about 100 mentors spread out across the state. So there's mentors available to anybody that is interested in getting the outdoors may not otherwise have the opportunity. And we do a lot of one-on-one mentoring in the state. Uh, we get well over 200 people into the outdoors every single year. And as we mentioned, it's a, it's a mentor-based model. So it's kind of like a big brother, big sister. With that, we not only do one-on-one mentoring, but we also have grown to the point where we have 10 programs and events. And those programs and events include both hunting and fly fishing. And we have two fly fishing programs. One is based in the Casper region and another one up in the Cody region. And uh, we're actually advertising uh, uh, for the application period on the fly fishing program in, in Cody right now. Um, and that goes through the end of next week. And we'll be advertising for the Casper fly fishing program here in a few weeks. And we have a number of hunting programs um, that range from deer hunting to pronghorn to pheasant hunting. And then we have two new programs that are in development uh, in collaboration with the Wyoming Catholic College in Lander and the Wyoming Wildlife Federation. And then with all that, another exciting tidbit of news since we last talked, we've established Wyoming Hunting Heritage Endowment with the Wyoming Community Foundation that, that is growing rapidly with the support from the community. And that endowment's all about getting women and youth into the outdoors and it will be there indefinitely it's in it's 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 really exciting to have uh the support of the community with for what we're doing so that's that's the highlights i could go on and on and on for a month well fred with this program the first hunt foundation basically marries someone that needs to be mentored with a mentor it's it's really a great organization and program that's simple to use and the best part is the mentors are right there, 100% involved in helping as many people that need help get into the outdoors because we know that there are families that are broken or maybe single moms or single women or kids that just want to get out and be part of the outdoors. You're absolutely right, uh, Drew. Um, the First Time Foundation, the mentors and part of the mission 
is we want to retain people that are new to the outdoors and a lot of that's building confidence and building skills and the mentors are there and available to support somebody that may may not otherwise get the opportunity you know they don't have the social network uh, they don't have a family members we've had a lot of new people move into the state and we also see a lot of people that are in underserved communities that just don't have the wherewithal to get started. And those mentors are there to assist and help. And, and we get a lot of single moms. Uh, we actually encourage parents and guardians to get involved with their kids in, with our mentors and in our programs. And our thought process there is that if we can build a family tradition around hunting and fishing, it's more likely that that youth is, is going to have the support from their family to continue on indefinitely. In, the, in a situation where a mother uh, comes to you guys at firsthuntfoundation.org, finds a mentor in the area, how does the process begin and how long of a process is it before things kind of get moving along? So the First Hunt Foundation's website that you mentioned, firsthuntfoundation.org, people have the option, if they have internet access, go to the website and select a mentor in their region or, their, or ideally their hometown. The other way to do it is to follow the First Hunt Foundation Facebook. It's FHF Wyoming. If, if you search for it on Facebook, that will have all of the organized education events and programs that I've mentioned, and it has a hot link to the application. So the, the process really, you're, you're with them from the beginning until, you know, they're, they're able to, to continue on and maybe become a, a mentor themselves. And actually the mentoring program is easy to get involved with too. Just again, go to firsthuntfoundation.org. You guys are doing a lot to help kids, families get involved with the outdoors. And it's still young, really. So just four years old now. We do appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much, Drew. It's always great to see you and be on your program. I really appreciate it. You got it, Fred. We appreciate you. Now, that's another show. It's in the books. Of course, you can go back and listen to all of our other episodes in the radio stations app. Get ready for another week of Wyoming hooking and hunting outdoors. Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors with Drew Kirby. If you have a question, want to make a comment, or have an idea for a show topic, message us on the My Country mobile app. Wyoming Hooking and Hunting Outdoors.